You are listening to the Mind Over Finger podcast, episode number 99. Welcome to the Mind Over Finger podcast, discussions on mindful music making, efficient practice, and building a purposeful career. And now your host, violinist, teacher, and high performance coach, Dr. Renee Paul Gauthier. Hi, everyone. I hope your day is fantastic so far as you tune in. Today's episode is very special. Sometimes conversations take you to beautiful and unexpected places, and this discussion is an example of that. I'm so happy to have Mark Gelfo back on the show. If you've listened to episode 8 of the Mind Over Finger podcast, you'll remember Mark, and if you have not, well, that's one to put in your queue for sure. Mark is a horn player and founder and CEO at Modacity, a revolutionary practicing app. In college, while pursuing his musical interests, Mark studied cognitive and computer science, and after applying the knowledge he got from those degrees to practicing the French horn, he became an internationally touring symphony musician playing with the San Francisco Symphony and Philadelphia Orchestra. As I've mentioned, Mark is co-founder and CEO at Medacity, and in his words, he loves building software to help create a world where everyone makes music. Mark and I were discussing lately about practicing, of course, and what it means to people and how we can become more masterful at it, especially these days when it can be so challenging to find a motivation to do it. And as we were talking More ideas were popping up and something pretty cool started to emerge. So here we are today recording this conversation for you. You'll hear us talk about the various elements that we think are essential to a practice that is efficient, aligned, and fulfilling. And we're hoping that you'll join us for an adventure in masterful practicing. And before I bring Mark in, I want to remind you that the doors for the Music Mastery Experience, my highly personalized group coaching program, are open for enrollment. This program is for you if you're a musician looking to reach a level of mindful practice that will shift your relationship with practicing, performing, and creating career opportunities. If you want to walk in the practice room without ever experiencing hesitation and doubt, if you want to feel empowered as you practice, if you want more results and you want to perform optimally time after time, you have to join the Music Mastery Experience. The program starts June 1st and it's going to give you all the tools you need to unleash all of your potential. I designed this program to be the solution to your problems and to be the catalyst for incredible things in your life. You're going to practice effectively and enjoy it. You're going to feel empowered and free in a performance. And you're going to have the tools to create the musical life you want. All of the details of the program are at mindoverfinger.com slash MME. So head there. Take a look and book your free conversation today because the program is already filling up. Let's you and I talk about your dreams, your goals, what's getting in the way, and how we're going to remove all of the obstacles between you and where you want to be. You're going to start seeing massive changes from the start, and you will not believe what you're able to accomplish by the end of the program. So go to mindoverfinger.com slash MME, book your call, and let's get you started. I like to keep the group very small, and there are a limited number of spots, so let's make sure there's one for you. And now, let's go to the show. Mark Galfo, it's so great to have you back on the show. Thank you, Renee. Pleasure to be here. Mark, you were on episode eight of the podcast, so almost three years ago, and you talked to us about your amazing app, Modacity. We had a super fun practice challenge that was so motivating for those who participated, and I still hear from the participants that to this day, they still use Modacity. I think it's a fantastic app. 
And you and I had a chance to talk a few days ago. It was such an inspiring conversation for me. And I feel like, and I think maybe you'll agree with me, that we're in a really interesting transition time. Some things are starting again. And for others, it's still really unclear when they're going to get back in action. And when they do, what is it going to look like? There is so much um, questioning around, you know, and I hear from a lot of people that they are lacking motivation and needing goals and community and that they need support and inspiration to get back into practicing. And you and I got into talking about masterful practice and um, this is where I'd like this conversation to go today. Let's see, what is masterful practice? Yeah, it's very important. Let's let's explore that. There's a Chinese proverb coming to mind that the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. And the second best time is now. Yeah. And as you mentioned, practicing each day that you don't practice well, you're missing out on the compounding benefit of showing up for your music and showing up for yourself. Mm -hmm. I think that in a nutshell, masterful practice is the kind of space and use of time and attention and intention to create outcomes that are meaningful and aligned with the present moment of what the world is asking for you, what your own being needs from you, and you know what kind of path you want to walk. Yeah, It's very easy to be aimless in practice. And I think that that's why a lot of people lose their motivation. Yes. And you know, that's what I spend my time thinking about. Absolutely. And I love the use of the words intention and attention together, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because often we forget one or the other. And Mm. I really agree with you. It's never too late to start. Even in the middle of a practice session, we can reset at any time and recommit to this attention and uh, intention. Um, What are some other elements of masterful practice, you think? Beginner's mind is something that is talked about all over the place. Mm -hmm. There's a way of showing up every day without knowing what you might discover. And beginner's mind simply says that you're open, open to learning that you don't haven't closed down the path of possibility. What happens when we try and make the future completely known is that we are making the future out of a past. Mm -hmm. Yes. So leaving room for that unknown to unfold, whether it's in the cracks between the notes or in what you, what music you get exposed to, I think is absolutely essential and finding that balance between certainty and uncertainty in your practice is something that marks a a master practicer. I love that you're talking about beginner's mind because in the system that I've developed with research and pondering on my own experience to really help my students and my clients practice better with more intention and attention and create more results. Um, beginner's mind is one of the mindset that I teach because, Mm -hmm. and you've said it beautifully, it is where so much growth can be gained. It's us stepping outside of these habitual movements, habitual drills, habitual ways of thinking, and constantly reinventing ourselves as we go. I mean, we don't need to reinvent everything. Of course, there are some things that work for us time and time again but it's to never leave anything out of the equation and asking oh what else what else could I try what else can I find Um, Mm -hmm. so for me beginner's mind is absolutely essential I love that you Mm -hmm. mentioned that what's coming to me is this idea of a map or a landscape of practice and on it there is repertoire and there's physical uh, tools and resources that you can use to reset your body. And it's like every day you get to take this journey on the landscape of practice. And there's always something new to discover. And there's also like the plants that 
you kind of want to water every day yeah. <laughs> because you know that that's your main staple crop or something to take the landscape analogy kind of far. And to bring it back to modacity, what you just said made me think about how it's such a great way for people to kind of do the the draft of this map of where they want to go mm -hmm. with their practice mm -hmm. to set that intention. Mm -hmm. One thing I talk a lot about is priming before a practice session. Now, there's a whole podcast episode about this. It could be anything from meditation, visualization, yoga, to simply taking one breath, but also setting your intention for the practice ahead or sitting down and making a very detailed plan or a very vague plan. It could be anything. Um, but that's one of the things I really like about Medacity is as we create the unfolding of a practice session, as we make this plan, there's still so much um, flexibility within mm -hmm. this guidance. So mm -hmm. it, it's kind of like following a beautiful thread and mm. a thread can lead us straight to our destination, but it's still very flexible. And um, I mean, there's so many features of mindfulness in the app that I really love as well. Uh, and we can talk about all of these things, but um, what you just said made me think about how you were so successful at creating this kind of uh, setup in the app. Yes, I'm, you're making me think of Google Maps mm -hmm. and how much cognitive bandwidth it frees up when you type in your destination and you press start and all of a sudden you just go step by step. All right, well, you know, you've driven for five minutes, turn left on this road, go here. If you end up deciding that you want to make a U-turn or stop at a cafe, that's totally fine. It'll reorient and figure out how to get from there to your destination. And Modacity is a little bit like that in that you've got sort of this flight plan or travel plan that you set up when you are using a practice list. There's a more spontaneous modes as well. I think about when, when I'm on an airplane, even as the next level or a train versus driving a car, mm -hmm. that as soon as I get on a train or an airplane, I have some of my most creative, productive output. I don't know if that's true for you as well, but as soon as I'm up there and I know like the plane is landing in I don't know, Cairo or <laughs> New York or whatever, that I don't need to worry about how I'm going to get to the destination. Mm -hmm. It And I'm free to be completely creative within this very narrow tube of metal that's hurtling through the air very quickly or on a train as well. It's on the track. Mm -hmm. And it, it's the fact that you don't need to mess with the track level or the flight plan that frees you to be creative in those moments. And I feel like it also, and, oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, yeah, it's just having a practice plan for me allows me to get very right-brained about how I show up for my practice when I know that time and direction and overall goal are already accounted for. And I just have pressed start on that and I'm going. Yes. It's funny because hearing you talk about this makes me think that if I go back to priming, another thing of priming is making sure that you're in the right environment and traveling like this provides you with an environment that helps you be creative because mm -hmm. you're not home. You can't attend to all of these other tasks. Oftentimes there's no access to email or distracting things like that. And it's a set period of time where it's just you and your thoughts. And um, so it's funny how, I mean, what you said just made me think about that is, when we sit in the practice room, we could ask ourselves, if I were on the train right now and my destination is in two hours and there's no distraction, what kind of mindset would that create for me? And if we could put ourselves in that mindset and create this kind of tunnel vision um, uh, state of being, I think that would be really interesting. I love that. Let's let's make a practice train that just goes a choo-choo <laughs> practice train that you get on and you can have your own car and practice. What you talked about priming a lot. Where have you seen people fail in to to take advantage of priming in their practice? When they don't do it, it's walking in the practice room and feeling like there's so much to do, feeling overwhelmed and just 
rushing to action. Mm. And like I said, it could be as simple as just taking one breath, just paying attention to the present moment. And one word you mentioned earlier that I love is alignment. Finding a Mm -hmm. moment of self-alignment. I often talk about mind over finger. My aim is to create an environment for people to have excellence rooted in self-alignment. Excellence Mm -hmm. meaning whatever it does for each individual person and self-alignment, same thing. What is self-alignment for you in that moment? But if we just take a second to sit down, identify how we feel, think about what's on the docket today, take a second to prioritize and really just slow down for one second and get set. Now, if I have major auditions coming up, my priming could take an hour. But although now that I have kids, I rarely have that luxury. But back in the days, I could take an hour to do yoga and visualization and meditation Mm -hmm. and very carefully detailed practice plans before I played a note. So that's what I mean by priming is just really how do you prepare yourself to be the most efficient and the most aligned that you can be before a practice session? Yeah. And then what is the minimal effective dose of that? Because I I look at mastery as knowing how to get the most out of the least. Mm. I love that. Say that again. We we need to hear it again. (laughs) How to get the most effect with the least amount of input. I love it. I say that to my students a lot, but in the less um, eloquent way where I say, you just got to work hard to be lazy. (laughs) But I mean, Mm. I'm kind of joking. They know I don't encourage people to be lazy, but it it has a, Mm. always gets a chuckle out of people when I say that. Um, Yeah, I mean, what if everyone just took one minute to do a breathing exercise before they start practicing? Just that alone would be transformative for some people. Absolutely. Body mastery is one of the elements that you and I had identified in masterful practice. And it goes to breathing. It also goes to alignment. When, When we say alignment, ultimately, there's a very physical metaphor, physical experience of alignment that when you've had that, it can move to emotional or mental alignment or musical alignment. And body mastery is, is the route to that. So when I was training Kung Fu, it was a Wing Chun Kung Fu, which was invented by a woman. And all about how do you create the maximum force generation with the minimum amount of muscular manipulation? Mm-hmm. How do you support? How do you align? And so there's ways that you can, for example, align your arms that five people can push up on you, but you've got your arm just in the right angle such that it's as sturdy as a wall and if you simply move your shoulder a little bit all of a sudden the entire thing collapses and you probably know this from holding your instrument that little micro adjustments and how you handle the weight and carry it through the torso and then how the weight of the torso carries through to the hips to the legs to the feet to the ground makes a big difference not just in the effect on your body after practicing for a while, but on the state of your mind as you're practicing. Absolutely. That's also why one of the mindset that I have in the deep practice model is bare awareness. Because when people can, when people bring their attention to how the body is functioning at all times, and also to how they're listening and you know how they're experiencing the kinesthetic, all, all of those things, all of these little things that you're talking about, it can really unlock so much power, so much uh, ease, and many abilities. I absolutely agree with you. You talked about these uh, elements of mastery that you and I were talking about, and we identified several, which I thought was were awesome. Um, can we go through these real quick? You already talked about body mastery. Was there anything else mm-hmm. you wanted to say about that? Not right now. Just, you know a few hundred lifetimes worth of (laughs) (laughs) content could be created on that. Yes, I agree with you. We were talking also about time mastery. What are your thoughts on that? Time mastery. Oh, so much there. When you're practicing, of course, 
you can be in rhythm with yourself, in rhythm with your day, in rhythm with the music, or you can be out of rhythm. And fighting time is, in my experience, one of the worst ways to live when you feel, oh, I don't have enough time to do this, I'm overwhelmed, I'm not getting the most out of my time. I know a lot of people that rush into a practice room, they're overwhelmed the entire time, they are pinging between things in sort of a disorganized way. Either that or they're spending way too long on some low priority, you know, practice item mm -hmm. of theirs. So understanding how to master time is ultimately a question of being productive. Like we talked about input versus output. And when you're tracking your time, you have a really, really good parameter for measuring your input and measuring your output and then understanding like baking as well or cooking that if you put cookies in the oven you want to put them in for I don't know 12 minutes or something yeah. if you put them in for 30 minutes you don't get better cookies <laughs> you get burned <laughs> cookies <laughs> and if you put it in for two minutes you've got raw egg cookies and it's the same with practicing there's like a right amount of time to spend on things until they're quote neurologically baked. Mm, I love this expression. Yeah. So time mastery is all about understanding how we create learning and what the time, the various time arcs of that learning are, how to use your time effectively. Yes. And what you're saying makes me think how people always ask me, how much time should I practice? And I always say, I don't know. How much time do you think you need? <laughs> Because that's the thing is, we have to understand that there is no set time that one thing should be practiced. This is why awareness yeah. is so important because at all times you want to assess how much time more would be the, the most efficient to spend on one set activity. So awareness and how we master time is really important because there is just no rules. Yeah. yeah. And I, th I think that your intention matters greatly you know so you had identified intention mastery as one of the kind of core pillars as well mm -hmm. and you're talking to someone who loves practicing with the timer i find it so fun i know that for some people it sounds like a horrible way to practice but for mm. me i find freedom in it because it helps me prioritize i love mm -hmm. to give myself challenges can i fix this in five minutes I want to warm up. I only have 20 minutes to warm up. What's the best warm up I can do in 20 minutes? And mm -hmm. the timer helps me keep on task. It helps me stay aware uh, with attention. And, and really, it's always a challenge to be efficient. So uh, for me, practicing with a timer, first prioritizing, setting the intention, you know, the to-do list, and mm -hmm. then keeping these challenges going and then the listeners can't tell but I'm smiling because sometimes it's just you see that there's only you know a few minutes left on the timer and that's a great incentive to just keep going <laughs> because mm. you're almost done <laughs> you know what I mean yeah totally having said that you can't just punch in the time that doesn't work I mean right I think that right. if they're listening to what we're saying they they know that we mean that <laughs> and that's where intention and attention really come into play yeah yeah and we've talked about intention a lot already uh, i've talked about priming and setting the intentions at the beginning and one thing i want to talk about in terms of intention is that is to not have rigidity with the intention we want to have mm -hmm. rigor in the practice and There's a recent episode of the podcast with Eli Epstein where he was talking about intention and rigor in practice. And I always want to specify that rigor does not mean rigidity. Rigor means to just show up with consistency and have a plan and have a plan to execute, execute the plan, you know. So rigor is great. Setting intention is great. And that if we stay in tune with what's happening, who we are in that moment, 
there might be a need to change the intention, to change Absolutely. the plan. So is there a way for us, for, for all musicians to, as they go through the practice, what can you do to send yourself little reminders of those intentions and check in? Mm -hmm. Is this still the intention of this moment? Uh, or do I need to change course? Do I need to change my plan? So what I would say is for people to have no fear to set intentions, knowing that at any moment they stay in tune with who they are in that moment, the kind of experience they're having, the kind of results that they're seeing, and if there is a need to modify, to go ahead. Uh, but for me, it's very important to have this idea of rigor without rigidity. Yeah, that sounds perfect to me. I was learning a piece the other day, and I think this this indicates how having a high level intention can be very useful. I, I just said, okay, I'm going to learn this thing um, at quickly, uh, basically before my I was I'm hanging with my mom these days, and she wanted me to learn this piece and play it for her, basically before breakfast was done. <laughs> so <laughs> on piano, which is not my main instrument. So I said, okay, I'm going to learn this thing and, and perform it for her uh, as, as she brings out breakfast and I got a three page piece of music. And if I had been too specific, I could have gotten caught in the weeds of details, but ultimately through paying attention to what exactly was easy what was challenging, going slowly, noticing when things felt baked in my head, when they felt almost baked, for example. And I was narrating my practice session to her as well, because she's a little earlier on the path of learning. And so it's fun to share what a practice session sounds like and feels like to someone who spent his entire life studying effective practice. And it was cool. And I, and I played the piece perfectly, almost perfectly for her as the breakfast came out that that to me is like in a nutshell how intention and attention rigor come into being that sounds amazing i, I feel like i need to go hang out with your mom <laughs> yeah she's she's the bomb <laughs> i need some tasks like this so we just talked about intention mm -hmm. and another thing we were discussing the other day is attention yeah what are your thoughts on that without it we're screwed <laughs> <laughs> It's very hard to get anything done when you can't pay attention, mm -hmm. when you're just reacting or not even knowing what to attend to. A few years ago, almost five, six years ago, I was teaching at the International Horn Conference and teaching about breathing and installing quote unquote software into the body such that the breath reminds you to pay attention. Mm. So like when you've got a trigger like that and we all are breathing and we all have sensation of breath, especially the, you know, wind players, we're really paying attention to our breath to use that as a trigger to remind ourselves to become mindful. It's like a real potent Trojan horse. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what's crazy too is how it keeps bringing me back to this bare awareness and something you just said made me think of beginner's mind as well but the importance of objectivity in this attention mm. because when you're playing and you're listening with biased ears you're not going to get the same results as if you are truly just observing what is and so I, we keep bringing up the same words, bringing back in the, the same words. But if we have attention with the intention of being objective, then we're really able to assess what's happening and figure out how to fix it or modify it or elevate it. So for me, this, this idea of bare awareness with utmost objectivity is so important. And you were talking about breath. So I just have to add this one thing is, for us string players, we're not even required to breathe when we play outside of <laughs> the need to breathe for a living. Yeah. But for me, beginner's mind means to remain curious, to have this enthusiasm of the beginner, because also a beginner has no expectations. A beginner is just mm. hungry and thirsty for all the knowledge, for everything he can learn. And but the other thing 
about beginner's mind is how can we pay attention to these fundamentals? And there's so often when we have a problem and we go complicated, it's a hard shift. And we, you know, try Mm. to go with big concepts of shifting. And my question would always be to the individual. Okay, let's go back to lesson one. Or even before that, let's go back to the, at the human level. Are you breathing? Mm. And then if they played the shift and they realize they're holding their breath, we all know what happens when we hold our breath. Physical mm-hmm. tension. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That often fixes the issue. Um, mm. Or another thing I say is lesson number one. What was lesson number one? And then we realized that there was a simple, simple posture issue that is causing the shift to not work properly. So it's how can you pay attention to the fundamentals, uh, remaining objective, and before you go complex, go simple and just check on these things first. So powerful. Mm -hmm. What you're describing is that there are recipes so to speak, of attention and moving attention through the body, through the music, through the emotions, to objective awareness, to even sub- subjective being when you don't want to be objectively analyzing your playing, for example, when you're practicing performing. Yes. And that all <laughs> goes under the umbrella of attention mastery, mm-hmm. being able to direct what this kind of like forebrain witness consciousness is actually paying attention to is, is an ultimate skill. Otherwise it's, you know, the monkey mind yes. can really cause a lot of havoc. <laughs> and you're going to have to forgive me for plugging my own thing here, but because you said there are systems and that's mm-hmm. absolutely what I teach in the music mastery experience. I put in that program, everything that I devised to help my students. And I really did some intense research and drew from my experience auditioning, performing for many years. And there are ways, there are systems, and I can teach everyone all of those things. So beautiful. Yeah. I'm so glad that you're doing that. Oh, it's been, it's been really wonderful. Another thing you and I were talking about is emotional mastery. And I have a lot of thought about that because first of all, that's if I go back again to the music mastery experience, it's something that we cover extensively. Uh, I feel like emotional mastery is something that's not talked about in the music world. I don't know if you would agree with me. I think that so many musicians are to varying degrees traumatized by an experience of some sort at times with teacher, colleagues, um, you know, unpleasant performances that leave a mark. And I think that gaining leverage over emotional mastery in the practice room can be really powerful. I mean, it starts with understanding what we're thinking, of course, but expectations that we have with ourselves or that we think people have for us is a big one. Dealing with frustration in the practice room is a a really big one. It's something I was talking with a client last week and talking about when you're frustrated, what do you do? Do you walk away or do you stay? And Mm -hmm. what there again, there's no specific rule is how can you turn your attention inward and see, can you untangle this, this beautiful frustration? Because if you stay with it for a second and try to see where it's coming from, it can be such a beautiful source of insight and wisdom and finding solutions to a problem. There's also times when maybe you need to just walk away, take a break, go get, grab a cup of coffee or meditate. Yeah. Um, then we talk also about performance anxiety and this whole emotional side of things attached to the emotions that rise when we prepare and we perform. Um, so this whole thing is... I mean, it's a big box to open. It's huge. (laughs) It's so important. And in many ways, one of the biggest leverage points, because if you show up and you've got a great plan and you've got a wonderful intention and you know how to pay attention, but you're in a 
fight, flight, freeze response and half your brain is off, you're not going to be able to execute. You've got frozen eyes and you're freaked out. It, it completely ruins the experience and you're missing out on massive learning because when you're triggered, when the amygdala is really active, when you've got some kind of really um, survival emotion happening, which happens a lot, right? Anger is survival emotion, grief, disappointment, uh, anxiety, all of these. Your body is not in a place to learn. It's in a place to survive or fight or flee or freeze. And you're literally like not able to mobilize the chemical cocktails required to integrate learning. And you, you're right. The pedagogical systems that we look at don't have a ton to say at the level of depth that exists right now and kind of the collective wisdom and ancestral wisdom mm -hmm. around emotional mastery. So yeah, even though it's a profound topic, just like attention, I think that there's some recipes or tools that you've spent your time researching and consolidating and me as well, just to survive and be able to make a career for myself because I've, I've carried deep, deep trauma and trauma is just an experience that your body can't process fully in the moment. So for me, like, you know, peeing my pants in my first recital <laughs> was, was traumatic, right? I couldn't process it. And it took me years to unpack that. <laughs> I think everybody has these little moments or, or things that can actually become the fuel for a very profound and productive practice. Mm, yes. There's so many things I want to say about this, but I feel like <laughs> this in itself could be a whole episode um, because expectations can be it can be so destructive in how we handle them. So I think that mm. maybe the, maybe we need to have a whole episode on that: how to handle expectations, our own and others. Well, we mm. we shouldn't be handling other people's expectations. That's that's their life. That's their problem. <laughs> how to ninja other people's expectations as they fly past you and you remain unaffected like Neo from the matrix. Yes. Bullet time. <laughs> yes. But I would say also there's the expectation that, so I hope I don't contradict myself here because I really want for all of my, my students, my clients and myself to have practicing itself be a joyful and rewarding experience. Having said that, I don't think we can have the expectation that it would that it's going to feel easy and light all the time. I think managing the expectation of how easy something is going to be, um, you know, thinking it's going to be easy, thinking it's going to be quick, thinking that so and so learned that piece and so you know, in so many days, why is it taking me so long? Mm -hmm. So these expectations of how things should be can be very detrimental. So I think it's great to have goals, ideals, but to manage the expectation that how it's going to unfold, I guess. Does that make any sense? Yeah, it totally makes sense. It, it's like you're talking about, again, rigor versus rigidity. Mm -hmm. You have a direction, but you dance there rather than, you know, force your way there, gritting your teeth. I love that. Yes, let's all dance there. <laughs> Absolutely. Mark, another thing you brought up, which I thought was so interesting, it's that impact versus output, mastery and practice. Not something we talk a lot about. Can you tell mm -hmm. us more about this? Mm -hmm. I think folks are used to orienting towards their output as far as, oh, I have a performance next week, I have an audition, I have a recital, I have a lesson where I need to play this thing or demonstrate this skill. And that's a small part of the world of the output of your practice. I think that especially now in these kind of COVID or post-COVID times that folks are looking for new outputs because they may not have a performance coming up and there's so much when you sit at your instrument or stand with your instrument or whatever that you're creating sound you're creating emotion 
you're creating an impact on your body. Mm -hmm. There's waste products, like literally waste metabolites being created. There's thought streams that are being created, new neural connections that are being created. There's so much output of a practice session and mastering what it is that you're creating, minimizing the waste that you're creating, composting whatever waste or recycling whatever waste. So for me, I'm very fascinated in how the outputs of my practice, whether it's a scale or a long tone or a song can be given to somebody else and not just die there in the practice room mm -hmm. and be used as say inspiration for somebody else or backing track material or whatever. There's so much that we can do to have our practice impact our bodies and our lives and our health and our relationships. You could play happy birthday once, once a day, every day and actually send it to somebody whose birthday it is, mm -hmm. <laughs> at which point your practice has touched the life of somebody else while giving you something to work on. There's so many tweaks that, that you can do to, to make it more fruitful in that way. Mm. Yes. I love that. I love that. One thing you had mentioned too that I thought was very powerful, it's that, that quote of in the long term, it's these little actions that you do every day that mm -hmm. have a big impact. I mean, it brings us back to the quote from the beginning is, if you planted the seed of a tree 20 years ago, what would be in front of you right now, you know? Yep. A tree. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, I use the analogy of the tree also in practice. When people are, if I'm going back to emotional mastery now, but it's making me think about that when I feel like people are getting, and I get evidence of this all the time from clients who send me messages and oh, I was so frustrated in my practice today. Hmm. And, and I say, you know, I think at times you get frustrated because the tree's not growing fast enough. You know, it's the same analogy was with the cookie. The cookie will take as long as it needs to cook. Yeah. But the you know, the process needs to be given the time that it needs. There's, I think there's a quote from Stephen Covey that I really like where he says, the process must be followed and the price must be paid. Mm -hmm. And I really see it as this haste that we have, we go for shortcuts and hacks. Uh, it doesn't work in making music, in building the skills to increase our abilities on an instrument. We really gain at, finding reward in the experience of practicing of of playing and gain that patience of watching that tree grow which is why you just want to go in and do the work and then one day you look at and you just can't believe how big and beautiful that tree is because you've been nurturing it for years yeah that's awesome and you don't yell at the tree because it's a sapling exactly <laughs> I mean, you can, it's just not going to do You can, it's not going to do anything. You might as well appreciate the saplingness of it. Yes. <laughs> Mark, I'm really enjoying this conversation. And you and I came up with an idea that I think is pretty cool. When I was talking earlier about, you know, people feeling like they're lacking some direction and motivation right now. And um, I think now would be a good time to share with the listeners this idea that we had. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Sometimes you just need a little accountability, a, a kick and an acceleration or a recipe, if you will, to get your practice back on the right track. So we're launching this masterful practice challenge together. And we've got your Facebook group is going to be hosting. Is that right? Yeah, it's the Mind Over Finger Tribe. Awesome. And we've got seven days. So the first day is going to be time mastery. We're, we're going to get folks set up so that they actually know how much time they're going to be spending during the challenge, how they're going to be spending their time and onboarded onto the Modacity app, which helps you make practice lists with timers and reminders and just super simple to give you all the tooling that you need to make sure that you can show up for masterful practice for the rest of your life. Yes. I find Modacity, you said simple, but it's also so powerful and it's an incredible tool. So I'm really excited about that. 
And then we're going to move on to day two, which is going to be intention mastery, where we're going to, you know, provide you with maybe some ideas to help you set some intentions at the beginning of your practice. That's right. It's going to use priming that Renee talked about, visualization, and just having some clear goals about how you want to feel and what you want to get done. And then on day three, we're going to be working on attention mastery. So I'll be introducing some tools that you can use to direct your focus and kind of corral your focus so that you know that you're attending to useful elements of your practice rather than wasting your attention or harming your practice through aimlessness. On day four, we're going to talk about body mastery and uh, cover some of those things that we've already talked about. There's also maybe some priming involved in that. And also for me, I feel like warming up can be a really great way to create some awareness in our body as we practice and just how to set the practice so that we are physically more productive. Beautiful. Day five is going to be emotional mastery. We're going to get into some of these strategies and tools for handling the emotions that come up in the practice room, as well as before the practice room that might block you from showing up for your practice or after the practice room that might keep you from integrating and learning fully what you've just worked on. And on day six, we will talk about impact mastery that Mark described so well earlier because there's the growth that practice generates for you, the skills it builds, the problem-solving chops, how it changes you, and this uh, awesome waste pollution concept that he shared, how it impacts your body. And uh, there's the quote that you shared with us, Mark, that I love, that if I keep doing what I am about to do today for the next five years, will I end up with more of what I want or less of what I want? So we'll discuss that on the six. Hopefully more of what you want. Yes, right. And on day seven, Renee and I are going to cover integration. So we're going to integrate everything that's been covered in the challenge, as well as cover how to really make sure you're consolidating the skills that you're building in the practice room so that you can recall them when you need to have them on tap. Mm. I'm already excited. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. And I think a lot of insights going to come out of that. So we're going to have all of these details for you, both in the tribe, uh, in the show notes of this episode, and also we're going to have a nice little URL for you. That's right. It's modacity.co slash masterful practice challenge, all lowercase. And Renee is going to pop that link in the show notes for everybody. Yeah. So I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I hope all of you guys join us. It's completely free to participate in. We're going to offer you a free seven days of Modacity Premium so that you can get started using all the features of the app completely unlocked. And if you make it through the seven days with a seven-day practice streak in the app, you'll be able to get a $25 discount on Modacity Lifetime. We're going to kick things off live on May 2nd, and we're going to end with a super fun integration session also live on May 8th, and I'll have more details for you guys about those. It's going to be very transformative and hopefully super interesting and unique. Yes. I remember how much fun it was the last time you and I did a challenge together, Mark, and people got so much value out of it, so much insight, motivation, and the support from the community was really so beautiful to see unfold. Everybody dancing together. It's incredible. It's like as individuals, we have our own little fire that we have. But when you combine the fires of a bunch of folks all burning brightly for masterful practice, it's a totally different kind of phenomenon. Yes. Well, I'm really excited, Mark. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. And uh, can't wait to see more of you in the coming days. Beautiful. Yeah, thank you. And thanks to everybody for investing your time and energy into good music practice.
Thank you guys so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Mark Gelfo, and I definitely hope we're going to see you on Sunday, May 2nd for the kickoff of the Masterful Practice Challenge. I can guarantee you fun, insight, support, and motivation. So make sure to sign up at modacity.co slash masterful practice challenge to receive the daily emails with all the prompts and details and for your free temporary access to the pro version of Modacity with all the options that the app has to offer. And until then, get ready, download Modacity and start having some fun. Modacity is an incredible app. It's fantastic for organizing all aspects of your practice. It keeps everything you need in one place. You can set goals, make practicing playlists, you can take notes, see statistics on your practice. It has a really cool deliberate practice function that helps with self-analysis, a metro drone function for great rhythm and intonation, and one of the most user-friendly and effective recording functions out there. Once again, find the details by signing up at modacity.co slash masterful practice challenge. And if you're listening to this episode after those days, but you're still interested in getting Modacity, we have a special discount on the Modacity lifetime licenses. Thanks to Mark. For that, you can visit modacity.co slash mind over finger. And you know, I will have all those links in the show notes for you. So that's it for today, but it's only the beginning of the Masterful Practice Challenge, so we will see you soon. Again, thank you, and à bientôt.